The reason I'm here, really, to be honest with you, is because you're, you're an iconic voice. I often say to people about Sinead, like, you know, people, some people have an iconic voice, other people can sing. It's a different thing. Like, you have this sound. Do you know what I mean? I keep saying to people, you know, there are singers and there's people with this magic tool, this magic instrument, this magic window. Kind of what the whole series will be about what is the meaning of the experience of the voice for people who actually use it. Well, it's, it's a lovely thing to talk about. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, I'm into God and stuff too. Nobody ever wants to talk about that, but nobody ever wants to talk about singing or, or music particularly, but specifically singing. And what do you think that is? I don't know whether the, a whole lot of things have got lost, I suppose, in the sort of modern music industry. A lot of things have got lost about music. Artistry has got lost. You know, there's a difference between entertainers and artists, not that one is worse than the other. But a whole lot of things have got lost, including, I think, people are not in love with music as they used to be. Like all the pop idol and the whole thing, it's more encouraging young people to want to be in music for other reasons. To be famous or to be beautiful or to have nice clothes or to be liked or whatever. Rather than, like I always say, the only reason a person should ever sing or make a record or anything is because they're going to go mental if they don't. And I think that's kind of lost. That's why people don't want to talk about the stuff that, you know, would have driven the rest of us mental so that we would have slept on park benches to learn it or whatever, you know, like my own singing teacher literally did that. A little Irish guy went off to Italy to study bel canto. People don't love singing that way anymore, you know, they don't think of singing as perhaps a shamanistic thing either, you know, they don't think of it as, as anything other than entertainment. What do you think of it? I mean, you, by definition, you're saying it's much more than that. And when you when you started out singing, not for everyone, not for everyone, you know. So. But let's say for you, in your case, I mean, yeah. you're in the entertainment industry. It's part yeah. of what you do. But you make a distinction that your your voice, you, you feel you have to use it. You feel you want to be using it because you have to. It's a, a compulsion. Uh, it, it is me. I couldn't be me if I wasn't singing. When I was a kid, it was necessary for me to say a certain set of prayers in order to get out of a certain set of circumstances, which had I not got out of, I possibly wouldn't have had a life in one way or another. I would have gone to jail or I would have ended up down pathways or worse. And music came to me very early, really around four. I was walking along one day and I began to hear music with the rhythm of my feet. And from then on, I always heard music every time I heard any rhythm, if it was the women's tights rubbing together when they walked, or trains or clocks or whatever. But as that first happened to me when I was walking down the road, I remember looking at the sky and going, wow, thanks. And I saw it as my life, my rope. So that's what singing is to me. It's, it's, it's the thing that keeps you hanging on. You could compare it with an umbilical cord, but I, a rope is what I always think songs are, and therefore singing is the same. Ropes that you can hang on to, if you like. And then also, for me, and I think probably for a lot of people, singing was very healing, that there were things perhaps people went through before they could even speak that you couldn't recover from because there weren't words for, nor was there therapy or whatever, and all you could do is make sounds, that the sounds themselves were healing to just be able to vocalise this thing. I remember it In Dublin in a rainstorm 
Sitting in the long grass in summer, keeping warm on the memory. Every restless night, we were so young then, we thought that everything we could possibly do was right, and we moved. Tell me, when did the light die? You will rise. You'll return the phoenix from the flame. You will learn. You'll rise. You'll return. You are. There is no other If you think of it, the first thing a human being does is use their voice. First thing a baby does when it comes out is cry. You're waiting for that sound. If it doesn't come, you're worried. So, like, what fascinates me is the voices in the womb, ready to come out, and it's the very first thing. And all the theologies of the world start with the idea that somehow the voice, whether it was sung or spoken, is what brought the universe into existence. What do you want to do? Does she need you like I do? Then there are people who say to some famous nun who used to say maybe it was Mother Teresa the oppressed always sing. And that is really true if you look at slavery times, you look at other times, chain gangs, people like myself perhaps who came from abuse or whatever, you know, that singing seems to be, it's a way of praying in some ways, but it seems to be a way that people feel, um, I don't know, ropes that you're, you can hang on in the bottomless lake and your, your little head can stay enough above that you can breathe. And again, see, it's hard to talk about music, isn't it? Because if you could describe music or talk about it, you wouldn't need it. That's right. It's for the stuff that you can't say. I know you're always telling me that you love me, but just sometimes I wonder if I should believe. And it's not always about the words. You look at Van Morrison, for example. It isn't really about the words that he's singing, it's the sounds that he's making. The sounds that he's making have a particular effect on you. You feel like you've been to church, in a way. You know that there is something else by his presence and by the sounds that he makes. It doesn't really matter what the words are. Same with Bob Dylan, as it happens, both of those artists have fantastic words, but what happens is when you particularly see them perform live, you know that there is something else other than what you see in front of you, and that is shamanism. You see the same with B.B. King. Again, it doesn't matter what he's singing. Yes, what he's singing is absolutely brilliant, and in fact, people like him get talked about more as guitar players, but they have a shamanistic way of singing. He's about five foot from the microphone. He's a voice thrower. He's got his head to the left. He throws his voice, which is a lot of what I do as well. And that's how I see vocal. And when I'm leaving home to go to work and my kids are upset perhaps that I'm going, I say, look, being a singer, which I really believe it's like being a doctor, you're bringing a certain healing. And the healing is that you're unlocking blocked things in people by the sounds you're making, not necessarily by the words, but also by your presence. You are a catalyst and you are an unlocker, if you like. You know the way people listen to you and they get that experience and you're, you're saying you're, you're in that special position, you're channeling or doing something for them. What is happening to the people when they're listening to that? I think what's happening, and in my case too, I, I'm sort of slightly embarrassed to say this because it's a little corny, but in my private moments before I go on stage, I have certain things that I always do the same way, same songs I listen to, same footage I watch perhaps, you know, and same set of prayers I say. Most important one being that I want to be a priest, actually. And really that's what I'm trying to do when I'm on stage. And I think what I do then is my experience is that I unlock people. I unlock without necessarily even knowing I'm doing it. 
emotions perhaps that people have, have blocked and I assume that's what all music does. You hear people crying in the audience, specifically men. You hear them howling, crying, stuff like that. Sometimes it's happiness that you've unlocked. They're crying from happiness or crying because they know there's something other than what we see in front of us, if you like. So, you know, they say horses in Greek tradition can be in the spirit world and on earth at the same time. Well, perhaps that's what's happening to an audience and yourself when there's a gig going on, you know, time stops. And there's a certain unlocking. That's what I seem to notice. And it's the type of unlocking that therapy can't do it or talking can't do it because it's not intellectual. It can't be intellectualised. You can go to therapy and sort your head out, but won't sort your heart out. The final stages of recovery from certain things is to get them out of your body, which is why singers are so lucky. We're getting everything out, but that's, I think, the unlocking. What happens is people start crying shit, starts coming out of their body. And that's a really a good thing, and it's not necessarily a sad thing, you know. Conversely, the opposite can happen. Somebody can go home and sit crying about how beautiful everything is, you know what I mean, and be happy. get from you when, when things are going well and things are right? I get the same thing back, the knowledge that there's something other than what I'm seeing in front of me, that the thoughts in my head are like clouds, I don't have to observe them, or at least I don't have to hang on to them, I can observe them passing. And also it's like meditation, the act of singing, it is meditation when you think about it, all, the way you're using your breath, also the fact that you're playing a character and you're therefore not thinking. If you're doing your job right, you're completely not thinking, so you're in a state of yogic meditation if you're doing your job right and that is my intention. And also to have fun rocking out with your band and I think an audience get off on that mostly but if you're doing your job right you're having all that fun and they're not noticing that you're also doing the shame and thing on them. If I tried to be that shame and part of me now right here I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So in some way I was also very attracted to the Hindu things you know I'm kind of a, interested in theologies you know but I see God and religion as two different things. I'm fascinated by the fact that Lee Perry says music is the Holy Spirit. Music can begin to get in and unlock those kind of things if it's allowed to where the industry hasn't deliberately taken away its power to do that. And that's, I think, a thing that, that shamanistic musicians can begin to unlock. I was called John Lennon a sky ripper. I would call those kind of artists a similar thing. You rip, you're trying to rip the sky so people can see what's beyond it. You said you, you were walking and you felt the rhythm, you became aware of music. Yeah. Your voice has been with you for a while mm. at this point. Can the voice be a guide? Can it show you things? If you weren't a singer, would you understand things the way you understand them now? Has, has the voice got the potential to kind of show you anything other than the fact that it emanates from you? Is it, is it a thing that creates a new set of perceptions that can teach a person, can enlighten? Uh, yeah, and I have to answer that in parts, I suppose, like a bit of a cake. To me, it's a spiritual, permanent 
discovery journey. And what I mean by that is there's a challenge every time you get on stage. It's all about getting yourself out of the way and you've got to do that off stage as well as on stage. If you, you've got to be the same person on stage as off if you see your job as a singer as being 100% emotionally open and honest and available at all times, you know. That's a difficult challenge, though, isn't it? Because some people would say, when I'm on stage, I'm, you know, I'm this thing. Mm. When I'm off stage, I don't have to be that thing. Say the, the your voice as your companion, like it's right. part of your right. And, yeah, that's what. It's and and about. has it changed over the years? And <coughs> has it shown you anything that you feel thankful for or happy or otherwise? Yeah, each time you get on stage, you learn what it is you need to learn next. You're a little bit freer, hopefully, or you're a little less free than you were two nights ago. The way I studied singing is bel canto. The teacher used to say, I'm not a singing teacher, I'm a freer of voices. The most important thing being that you always sing in your own accent. So I always speak lyrics a lot to myself before I sing them, so I make sure, in fact, I'm just speaking them with notes when I go to sing them. That's the challenge every night, and it's the thing that keeps you getting on stage. Your voice keeps encouraging you to be you. It's calling you all the time more and more to be you and encouraging you to develop that honesty more in how you communicate on stage and off stage. It's all about can you sing it in your own voice and can you really be you and can, in the midst of all the fears and challenges of being on stage or travelling or all of the other stuff, can you still stand and really be you as such? And to me, that's a type of a spiritual thing, you know. What it does is it's calling you to constantly learn. Like, if you ever felt that you had finished learning or you had nothing to improve, you wouldn't bother getting on stage and you wouldn't even get out of bed. The whole excitement of getting on stage is what might go wrong and can I do it right and can I do it even better or, you know, and all the time through the gig you're thinking, making mental notes, which I'm sure you're doing yourself, I must practice that line tomorrow. I got that word a bit funny, I must speak it for myself later, you know, that kind of way. So you're constantly learning and that's what's exciting about it. It makes you want to learn stuff. And aren't musicians nervous sometimes? You know the way when you're when you're trying to tell an engineer what you want and you feel if you over-explain it'll just kill the moment, you know? yeah. Well, that's why you need an, an, an engineer and producer who you were married to and is the father of your first job. Because <laughs> they get you, it. They get it, do you know what I mean? And you can fart around them. It's very important to be able to fart around your producer, genuinely. That's John Reynolds you're talking about. And he's been there from the very beginning. I mean, he's a very, very big part of your sound, isn't he? I mean, you're, you're really comfortable working together. Yeah. And that's how open and honest singers have to be. Literally everything is on the table. You're so open that it's almost embarrassing. You know what I mean? You don't mind making your mistakes anywhere on or off stage in front of everybody because that's what you do in the studio, isn't it? You go into the studio, you sound like a strangled cat. You sound mortifying yourself in front of everybody till it goes right. Do you know what I mean? That's the other attractive part of it to me. You know, the chaos, like the orchestra tuning up, you know, before the, the order. So you, you become a person who doesn't do embarrassment as such. And I'm curious, Sinead, about how your voice has changed from, say, that first album, The Lion and the Cobra, to today. Because I've heard you say before that in the beginning you were writing the songs like Troy and Mandinkin, but it wasn't in your own voice. It, it wasn't your own accent. Yeah. My first two albums I'm singing in American accent because we were rare in the 70s, it was uncool to be Irish. You wouldn't dream of singing your Irish accent. First person I think who did was Geldof, and then it was Kane Cool because he was cool, you know. Well, I sang like the artist I admired. It's just what you do when you're young. I copied Chrissy Hine, Bob Dylan, a bit of David Bowie, a bit of, you know, I wasn't Sinead at all. The first time I started being me was Universal Mother. That's my fourth album. 
up until then I've made three albums being everybody but me. You know, my words all right, but I didn't know it was cool to be me. And cool to be Irish me, goddammit. Was there a moment? Was there was there a time when you when you knew for sure that you had this this vocal power? Um, I think maybe three or so moments come to pass. The first being when I was possibly about nine, singing in the communion choir at Sign Hill, where I went to school. It would have been after the time I made my own communion, so I don't know what age I was, but I really felt a connection then with God, actually, and I really felt that was the audience, and I felt it was working, and there's, a, and I meant it, and it was genuine. I loved all the harmonies, and I loved the fact that we were all singing hymns and everything, so that was the first time, I guess, I felt there was a power in it, there was a magic in it. It was a very solid connection, you know. Then, I guess, my mother was a person who had an un unidentified illness. You know, it was the 70s in Ireland. Time was difficult for women. You know, they couldn't work when they got married, whatever. A lot of them developed problems because of this, you know. Now, my mother was very, very severely distressed and disturbed person and nothing could cool her down except me singing. So it was like singing the devil's asleep for want of a better description with all due respect to my mother but she loved in particular the song Don't Cry For Me Argentina and she had always been very musical by my mother and I used to sing this song to her when she was in a terrible state and it would literally put her asleep. She'd be on the sofa, gone peaceful, everything cool and nice. And that was a, a power because this was a woman that was, you couldn't calm her down, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? She was out of order, but that was a power of singing as well. It won't be easy You'll think it's strange When I try to explain How I feel That I still need your love After all that I've done you won't believe me All you will see is a girl you once knew Although she's dressed up to the nines At sixes and sevens with you Then what happened was busking. Very powerful. I learned about intention. You want to stop people. So you got to sing loud. But not only that, not just sing loud, your intention has to be to stop them. So it isn't the words, it's how you use your voice, basically. So I learned how to do that. So, you know, you could be singing the ABC, you could be singing whatever, but my intention is to stop that motherfucker right there in that hat. He's going to stop right in front of me now. And I learned how to do that and it worked. Uh, Don't cry for me, Argentina usually worked as well. But those were times that I learned that music was, was real powerful, you know. And then, of course, you know, the Pope business, obviously, you know. But, yeah, no, I think stopping people in their tracks or, or putting people asleep is, you know. Don't cry for me, Argentina The truth is I never left you All through my wild days, my mad existence I kept my promise, don't keep your distance
listen to when, like, who really gets you going when you want to listen to stuff? It, it depends, really. My habit is I'm obsessed with Chicago blues, which is basically the kind of blues you can dance to, funky, happy blues, you know, as such. I love the whole guitar thing of it. I love the jolliness of it. I don't like sad music. I don't listen to sad songs, especially when I'm sad. I think that's the worst thing a person can do. If you're sad, you should never listen to sad songs, ever. I love Chicago blues, I love Rasta music, and I love Hindu music. That's pretty much what I listen to. I listen to John Lennon and stuff as well, and the other thing, but my addictions are Chicago blues and Hindu music yeah, and Rasta music. I'm gonna put my pink dress on And do my hair up tight I'm gonna put some eyeliner on I'm gonna look real nice I'm going down to the church On the 4th and Vine I'm gonna marry my love And we'll be happy for all time Yeah, he's the sweetest man you could find So gentle and so kind And he's got those big brown eyes I can't believe me luck, he's mine not that he's no worse Cause you know his love is serious what, what, is, what is the thing with Rastri? It's a passion with you. His for music has a priestly. The music has a priesthood, which has been my fascination since I was four, and I had that answer to that prayer, and I looked at this guy and I made that association. So I was attracted to the Rasta movement for two reasons, because I believe God and religion are two separate things, and that religion is an obstacle that has to be taken down, which is what the Rasta movement is based on. But I loved the idea of music as a priesthood. I could be a priest that way. Try. And I loved that in Ireland, my experience in the 70s and, and all was, they didn't teach you the scriptures, but the Rastas taught scriptures through the songs. You learned the books of the prophets and it made you want to go read them and you realised that these priests had been lying to you your whole life, that in fact, Jesus is an anti-religious character and so is God. So they taught a lot, and uh, yeah, music as a priesthood, that's what they are, that's that's the whole basis of their movement, music as priesthood, you know. Is it possible to be a singer in the way that you've described the experience of being a singer if you're an atheist? There's no has to or should. It's just depending on each individual's upbringing and experience and environment and all of those things, the things they happen to be in love with. I was born in a theocracy, you know, I luckily only took up the good things about that. I fell in love with the idea of God and blah, 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 blah. You know, the other thing I think is that God's probably an atheist anyway. Do you know what I mean? I always get atheists to pray for me because God's probably sick of listening to everybody else. You install kings and take them. Truly there is no one beside you. I don't yeah, I think the answer is probably yes, a person can communicate spiritually or it can become apparent from being in their presence that there's something other than what you see in front of you. Are clothed with strength. There is the sea, vast and wide, with all its creatures beyond number. There go the ships. They all 
whatever about reggae, how much have you been influenced by Irish music? Like the traditional, the older sounds of, say, the Shannos? I think the singing style has definitely been an influence. You're not going to like this, but I can't stand traditional Irish music. I can't stand Shannos, and this is the reason why nobody ever wrote a song when anything good ever happened. It's like nothing good ever, ever, ever happened. Nobody wrote down anything good, you know, so I don't like sad songs. I just don't, I don't know what's the point. What's the point of living in all the misery? I appreciate the ghosts and the spirits of the people who wrote the songs, having said that, though. And there's a certain form of mediumship, perhaps, in, in it, but it's too miserable. What's the point? Let's move on. So I don't really deal with that, but I do think accidentally in some of my singing style that my Irish DNA is in there. And it was important development for me as a singer and a writer to make the Shan Nose record that I did make. Well, it wasn't Shan Nose, but to make the traditional record that I did make because it required a certain standard of singing and emotional delivery. And I, after that, one could only try to improve. You couldn't come down, lower the bar, you know. What was your favourite song on that record? Uh, Peggy Gordon, yeah. <laughs> Gordon, you are my darling. Come sit you down upon my knee and tell. just the highness of the key and the fact that it, I suppose I was able to play the character with, with such sadness. There was just this dreadful, just awful sadness. characters and not everybody plays them well but to be able to get into the character and see how upset he was that she wouldn't sit in his knee or whatever and, you know. I heard you singing another song kind of like that, the Foggy Jew Yeah. What was, what, was, what was the... That was the melody, I didn't care about the words it was intention and melody and the fun of playing with the chieftains I mean, you, that was the biggest fun of all it was the most rock and roll time you could have hanging out with those dudes, trad guys are the wildest they're way wilder than rockers so he's have a rock and roll time with them. But with that song, it's the melody. To a city fair road I There are lines of marching men In squadrons pass me by No pipe did
the intention that you can put into that melody and the intention is in, on my part is just to again like busk and stop everyone in their tracks I, it wasn't about the words I just wanted to stop everybody in the room just stop And in thinking and talking about influences, now I know you have a great craw for Noreen Nureen. You find her enchanting, don't you? Yeah, again, that's somebody who has music as a priesthood and very unusual for an Irish woman. She would have been a priest, she would have liked to be a priest. The way she went about it was music. dedicated her life incredibly you know she practically is a monk in Glenstall at this stage she did her thesis on uh, music as a priesthood and the, the, uh, the healing sound of the Gregorian chants so I learned about the power of the chants really from her and I learned some of the chants from her and the monks consequently through her the power of singing as prayer if you like But she was way ahead of her time in terms of priesthood as music, certainly in Ireland. Like the only other priest musicians were Rastas and perhaps Van Morrison. Well, she was way ahead of her time. You mentioned Irish DNA. I mean, is there such a thing? Yeah, of course there is. Like, you know, I can't sing like an Arab man or woman. Uh, I can't sing blues like an African American. African American can't come here and sing Shan Knows New like Derek or Cahan. He just wouldn't be able to. You know, it's not in the body. It's definitely a body is your instrument, and you know what I mean. And yeah, I do. Obviously, there are, none of us could ever, if we studied in a million years, sing like Indian people. Could we? We just couldn't do it. You say you're not attracted to sad songs, but when I hear you think of you singing I mean I think of, oh I used to write miserably sad songs because I was miserably sad it was just a sound as well you were very yeah. good at emoting with your voice I mean no I'm an actor you go there yeah I mean it like you, Stanislavski actor, actor what I mean by that is method that you only live in the character for three months it sends memories if it's my song I've written about me then it's my memories if it's 25 years later and I'm still singing it, I have to change the memories and invent other people I'm singing it about or whatever. But if it's characters you're playing, you're doing exactly the same as a Stanislavski actor. You're, you're using your sense memories and everything. You're, you're 100% there emotionally, but you can switch it off three minutes later. It doesn't bother you. Could you instance a song that's a good illustration of that, where you, you trawl back through time of something you may have felt before but don't necessarily feel now, but the, but the, the memory is still there? Well, I think Nothing Compares is a good example of what I'm talking about. Now, A, as part of my training in bel canto, and I really believe it too and feel it, you should never sing a song that you don't emotionally identify with, and you can't sing it. You won't deliver it. Your body won't have it in you. So I don't sing certain songs of my own that I don't identify with anymore. Now, I've had a struggle with Nothing Compares, only begun in the last two years. So I've been singing it for 20-something years, 25 or 6 years. Now, it used to be it reminded me of my mother. So, you know, I could think of that and that was fine. Then I ran out of things in my own life that I could identify. You know, I could imagine I was singing it to other people for a few years. I could imagine I was someone else singing it to someone else. I can eat my dinner in a fancy restaurant. By the time we got to the 50th anniversary celebration of the Late Late Show, I had to imagine I was God singing it to people, that it was God was upset at the loss of people. I actually have run out and I've now finally put it out of the set because I have to be true to my principle even though of course that's what the audience want to hear I cannot find anything anymore I've found 25 years worth of different things like I say sometimes it was me or my life sometimes I might pretend it was you and whatever make up something in my head but I have now run out of anything so I'm, so I'm just not going to do it because all I'm doing is delivering the notes and the words and there's no 
I have no feeling about it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that Brilliant. can happen. That's, that's incredible insight. There is one song I won't sing anymore, Ashton Gale, don't I? Yeah. I sang it as a kid, because people are always... It's more than wanted to this, I want to Yeah, say. well, I, I, I love the song, I love to not think of bears and everything, but I just have run out, and there's no point lying, so... Whatever about letting go of a song like Nothing Compares to You, has there been a time when you just couldn't sing anymore, when it, when it was just gone? No, I found that I... Hmm, after the album that had Nothing Compares to You on it, I came in for quite a kick in for some years for really being me. You know, me seemed to be a big problem for quite a lot of people. And I found, and I can hear specifically on Am I Not Your Girl, the follow-up album, my spirit is a bit beaten. I'm only operating on two engines, maybe one engine. My, I've, you can hear in the voice that this is a person who feels a bit broken, a bit beaten, you know what I mean? I was very young and I was very fragile and vulnerable anyway. And then I found that all a bit much, to be honest. So I didn't get my engines back, really, till probably the last album. But I think if you listen to Am I Not Your Girl, it's a bit of a loss there, you know. But this half pint imitations put me on the blink I'm wild again beguiled again a simpering whimpering child again Bothered and bewildered 
I never felt that I didn't want to sing, but I just had, if your spirit is your instrument, my spirit was a bit. <laughs> and do you ever think of other uses of the voice related to you? The spoken word? The, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is as a mother, a voice is employed, you know, in all manner of ways. So my seven year old is very good at pretending to be hard of hearing until I say sweets in a certain tone of voice. Like, so I can't find him in the house and yes, she, yes, she, where are you? No answer. I go, I've got sweets for you in exactly the same tone. Dan, he'll come, you know. But actually, what struck me when you asked me that question too is um, one thing I've noticed is that I'm very sensitive to other people's speaking voices. I can tell what moods my friends are in. I can tell if my friends are upset. The other thing I've noticed is I fall in love with people because of their voices in the first place. I've noticed a pattern that there are certain patterns in the types of people you fall in love with. The sound? They have gentle voices. There's something about their voice that made me first actually go, hmm. you know, some kind of gentleness in their voice or whatever. Or you get crushed on people because of their voice. But, yeah, I do think it would be handy at school if they taught you, you know, how to use voice soothingly. Like, say, if you have a disagreement with someone, that can either escalate or not escalate, depending on how people use voices, i.e. letting people finish sentences. When people don't let each other finish sentences, that's how arguments happen. But I am inclined to, now that I've got older, now I used to be a right jumpy fucker, as we all know, you know, temperamentally speaking. But as I've got older, what I do is, if I were to be having a row with a, a boyfriend or whatever, I would whisper, or I would have the row in writing. I wouldn't have it in a way where there's yelling or there's any aggressive use of voice. So I would deliberately bring my voice down and make it quieter so that things stay calm. So you, you can definitely create atmospheres with, with voice, you know. OK, I want to talk about Ireland. Specifically, I want to talk about the Fanon, about the fact that there never really was one. There was no Fanon. See, Irish people were only allowed to eat potatoes. All of the other food, meat, fish, vegetables, was shipped out of the country under armed guard to England while the Irish people starved. And then, in the middle of all this, they gave us money not to teach our children Irish. And so we lost our history. This is what I think is still hurting me. You see, we're like a child that's been battered as to drive itself out of its head because it's frightened, still feels all the painful feelings. But they lose contact with the memory, and this leads to massive self-destruction, alcoholism, drug addiction, all desperate attempts at running. And in its worst form, becomes actual killing. And if there ever is gonna be healing, there has to be remembering and then grieving so that the gun can be forgiven. There has to be knowledge and understanding. So there is, there's an enormous power that, you know, amongst all the other stuff that would be useful for them to teach you at school, they might teach you how to use voice helpfully, you know. <laughs> to the next mm. phase always. Yeah, and not always just the singing part though, but the... The whole thing. Yeah, yeah. the bass and the drums and everything.
no more Brought a lot into singing love songs for I don't want to sing them anymore I don't want to be that girl no more I don't want to cry anymore because at the end of the day, you're a rocker too. You've got a band. Yeah. How important is that to you, that bond, that, that relationship with the band? You've got to be best mates. You've got to be friends. You've got to enjoy each other's company. You've got to make an effort to socialise with each other. You don't have to know all each other's secrets, but you've got to love hanging out with each other. That has to be the thing that is exciting you most, is getting on stage with each other. And that is genuinely the thing that does excite me the most, you know. You've got to be unable to sleep because of rehearsals, because you're so excited. If you're not friends, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work. You cannot make music if there's bad vibes. And I'm inclined to just close my eyes and focus on the band and how lucky I am. It's completely mental. You feel like a teenager, don't you? It's like you're in your bedroom again with your deodorant can pretending to sing. <laughs> Is it a kind of a dream? It is. It's, it's the luckiest job on earth, actually. I mean, they're dreadful consequences of the job. There are absolutely awful prices to be paid for having this job, you know, prices that people wouldn't even begin to imagine. You know, your life is the price, the more successful you are. The higher the level, the greater the devil, you know. But equally, it's the luckiest job on earth because you get to permanently be a teenager. You don't have to grow up ever. You can be a teenager forever. You know what I mean? Everyone, the crew, everyone in the music business, crew, bus drivers, singers, musicians, the guys that do the lights, they're all teenagers. Everybody, all of us. It's a world for teenagers. Agree. If people only knew how silly it is, how, how much fun that is. Yeah, you know, they wouldn't I mean, actually believe it. No, and also it's an enormous love in it. Like really, as I say, the, the consequences of the job are dreadful. I mean, and the consequences of touring are—it's it's terrible. I mean, travel, you're all alone. It's lonesome. You know, you're tired. You're taking three flights a day, five-hour drives. After la la la, la the, you're scared of flying. You've left your kids and la la. But you do it for that hour and a half on stage because you love that so bad. You know what I mean? You need to pay your bills too. But it's songs make you do stuff even though you're terrified or you're going to have a life of hell consequently but you still bloody do it you wouldn't stay with a man if you had that kind of consequences or hell you know or a woman do you know what I mean you wouldn't stay with anybody <laughs> but you'd stay with songs you know I am petrified of flying crying terrified but I'd do it I'd go all the way to America to sing two songs and then come home crying all the way back just to go sing two songs I wouldn't do it to see a man <laughs> Thank you for being so open, no. so fun. That's cool. Because <laughs> you are, you got that look, you're going, you know, <laughs> that happy face. But it's one thing I wanted to ask you myself about your own music. You've been in bands for a good while. You, you, you know, you work with the kind of the rock thing. <clears throat> what, what else do you want to do in music? I mean, what other experiences have you not had in the context of making music that you'd still like to have? Well, I want to learn to read and write music and be a composer and. Um, I have tons of melodies inside me, but I have difficulty when it comes to playing guitar or learning an instrument well enough to, yet anyway, to get down all the melodies I have inside me, which can be frustrating. And if you're a creative person, you're not getting it out of you, it can, as you know, Frankenstein's a monster on you, you know. So I'd like to do that. I would love one of my hugest desires to write songs for other people, keep working on songwriting, write songs every day. This is why I love Chicago blues. I study what these guys say about songwriting. I watch them and I obsess with finding them on the internet and they talk a lot about songwriting. So I learn a lot every day and I write every day to be in the habit and I really want to write songs for other people. 
I want to write songs for movies and stuff too, keep making my own records, but I've also have what I call quirky aside records that I really want to do. Record companies never let you do them, so you have to get rich and make them yourself. But I, I really want to do an album of opera songs, right, but sung in a normal voice. You know, it actually felt quite nice. So lots of writing dreams there, Sinead, but you'll keep singing. Yeah, and I love how I feel after I've been singing. Uh, I'm a woman, I'm a middle-aged woman, you know, we're subject to menstrual cycles, we're subject consequently to being moody or whatever, you know, I might go on stage blue, I might have been crying all day for nothing. Fucking, I'd go on stage happy as Larry by the time I've sung verse two, come off stage a completely different person. So it's like, it's my little happy place as well, you know. But whatever might be going on, I end up feeling great. Vocal Chords in Conversation with Sinead O'Connor is an Athena Media production for RT Lyric FM, made with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland and the TV licence fee. In the programme you heard the following songs by Sinead O'Connor, Thank You for Hearing Me, John I Love You and Famine from Universal Mother, Troy and Mandinka from her first album The Lion and the Cobra, Forth and Vine, Throw Down Your Arms and The Glory of Jah. And from her most recent album, I'm Not Bossy, I'm the Boss, Take Me to Church and Eight Good Reasons. You also hear Sinead's version of Nothing Compares to You, Bewitched, Bothered and Bewildered, Don't Cry for Me Argentina and Peggy Gordon, as well as The Foggy Dew in collaboration with the Chieftains. From Van Morrison, you heard a live version of Common One, John Lennon's Instant Karma, B.B. King sitting on top of the world and Nori Nirian with the monks of Glenstall singing Iktehega Hegypt. The vocal chords producer is Helen Shaw. The audio editor is Amy Miller and it's presented by myself, Irla Olinord. The recordist with me was Michael Gallen. You can find out more about the Vocal Chords project on www.vocalchords.ie.